How great is our God. How great thou art. Those are two great professions of our faith. And both of them, whether we're saying them or whether we're singing them, they put God in his proper place of majesty on the throne. Say how great he is. But tonight, I'm going to take that proclamation and I'm going to turn it on its head. Tonight I'm going to speak about how great our God is by asking the question, just how great is our God? If you would, be finding with me in your copy of God's Word, uh, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment. I was looking uh, for illustrations for this message, and I came across that we're just a few days past the 53rd anniversary of the successful failure known as the Apollo 13 mission. Now, the reason it's called that is because it was a failure due to the inability of the crew to land on the moon, the, the spaceship malfunctioned, but it was successful because they were able to bring everyone back home. In 1995, Ron Howard made a movie about uh, the Apollo 13 mission. And one thing I noticed in the movie is it had become clear at that time. Now, I don't remember, I wasn't there, maybe some of y'all do. Uh, but this was after the Apollo 11 moon landing, or Apollo 13, and before they launched, the news media wasn't really that interested. It had, space flight had already become sort of stale and boring and mundane at that point. Um, even such that when, in the movie, they show the astronauts in their, their zero gravity environment, they they have their camera and they, they present a live stream back to Earth, none of the networks picked it up. And of course the families are wondering, why are you not showing this feed uh, from outer space of our, of our families? But once tragedy hit Apollo 13, the news media all of a sudden became very much interested. Uh, so much so that they were there in Jim Lovell's front yard wanting to set up broadcast equipment and, and have coverage right there on the front lines. Uh, when Jim Lovell's wife was asked for her permission uh, that they could set up equipment, her response was landing on the moon wasn't dramatic enough for them. Why should not landing on it be? You know, it it became something that was mundane, but then when there was something sensational, it was newsworthy. But the, the NASA space program has always been amazing to me, so that's, that's one of my favorite movies, but I've always enjoyed, when I was growing up, we would go to the Alabama or to Florida to the different space centers, getting to see all the, the rockets and exhibits there in uh, the museums. And I remember one time when we were in Florida, we were up the coast a ways, I believe we were in St. Augustine, and we got to watch a shuttle launch from that distance, hear the sonic boom, and it was just a, just a great experience. But you know, something that is so amazing as a space flight that had become boring almost at its infancy, and something that I'm still um, amazed by, I can't help but ask myself, do I share the same excitement and awe towards God that I do something like the space program? Do I live my life in such a way that it's a testimony to the God that I serve? Because when people look at me, when people look at you and know that we're Christians, do they see a great God that we serve, or do they see a second-rate cosmic being of some kind? 
So tonight as we look at Psalm 139, uh, we're going to see, talking about the greatness of God, we're going to see King David declare the greatness of God by recognizing God's omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. Before we uh, read our scripture, let's pray. Our Father God, we come before you tonight. We do come to this place in awe of you. God, you're great and you're magnificent. And I pray tonight as we open up your word and your scriptures that that would be renewed in us. That we would never see you, Father, as just just a mundane fact of life that you're with us, but that it's amazing that you love us. God, I pray now that you will speak through me to each one of us here tonight. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Psalms, as you may know, it's unlike any other book of the Bible. It was the Jewish hymnal, basically. It was a collection of their songs that they had for worship. And much like our hymnal, you can't sit at the beginning of Psalms and read all the way through it and get one single story through it. Each Psalm is, is something different, but they're arranged in such a way that they make sense together, a lot like our hymnal. They, they're arranged in order to um, aid in worship. And like many of our songs, the psalmists wrote based on experiences they were going through or had been through. Uh, for example, tonight uh, we're going to see uh, how three different psalms are tied together. But in 2 Samuel 11, that's where we read about King David. He stayed home from battle. He wasn't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. And he looked and he saw Bathsheba and he sin we know how that account goes and he thought he was getting away with a hidden sin i mean he had his had her husband murdered and everything but then the prophet nathan in second samuel 12 comes before him with this this great um parable about a rich man who had slaughtered a poor man's lamb and david is outraged and nathan says you are the man. And at that point, after, after Nathan confronts David, he cries out to God, and he, he's sorrowful, he's repentant. And we have that in what we know today as Psalm 51, the penitent psalm. After Nathan confronted him, he wrote this Psalm 51. And we see that David cried out to God, and even though David still had to face the consequences, God was faithful and forgave him of his sin. Then when we look backwards at Psalm 32, following David being forgiven and rejoicing in forgiveness, he then wrote this psalm that where he testified of the joy in forgiveness. You know, he had been in sorrow, he had been in misery because of his unforgiven sin, and now that he was forgiven, he could do nothing but praise. You know, when we experience the forgiveness of God, praise and worship should follow in our lives. It should be a given that we are moved by God and see how awesome he is. So then after writing that 32nd Psalm, David writes this 139th psalm that we'll be looking at tonight where he is, he's committed sin, he's been called on it, he's cried out to God for forgiveness, he's praised God for forgiveness, and now he's going to take time and tell God, well, he's going to tell God something he already knows, but praise him for the awesome, wonderful, great God that he is. Yes. So let's look at our text. In the first six verses of Psalm 139 tonight, I want us to see that God is omniscient. That means he knows you. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. 
and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. There's a lot of, outside of Christianity, there's a lot of isms in the world, and one of them is called deism. There were some of our founding fathers that were deists, uh, Thomas Jefferson being most notable. But deists believe that God created the universe, he set everything into order, set everything into motion, and then stepped back out of the way. They see him as a great clockmaker. You know, he, he builds the clock, he winds the clock up, then he lets the clock run without further interfering with the clock. But the scripture here tells us something different. God knew David not just in a passive, far off way, but he knew him, he searched him, he judged him, and he knew David in all of his actions, whether rising up in the morning, going about his day, or lying down at night. God was not the clockmaker. He was directly involved in David's life. Yeah, I looked up this statistic according to census.gov. The population of the world is nearly 8 billion, with a B, um, how they get that number is beyond me, but uh, I'm not going to take time and count them, so we'll go with it. Uh, but, you know, when you think about 8 billion people, a lot of us, we have a few close friends and acquaintances, and we, we feel that we know them pretty well. And there's, there's some people that are, are really close friends that we think we know them as well as we know ourselves until... They do something to surprise us. They say or do something that, you know, it may break our trust or just something that will hurt that relationship that we never saw coming. Now imagine being aware of the thoughts of eight billion people. Never being surprised by what they say or do that and so much more is the omniscience of God. He knows everything there is to know about everything and everyone. You know, as children, we learn the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. And it's, it's a very simple song. It's a very simple message. But it's amazing that God knowing us that he loves us in spite of ourselves. He knows us and he loves us anyway. So you could just about flip that around and say, Jesus knows me, this I love. It's amazing he loves us, but it's also amazing that he knows us and still loves us anyway. God knows our rising up in the morning. He knows our path throughout the day. He knows our lying down at night. And according to verse 4, he knows everything we're going to say before we say it. And truthfully, I struggle with that myself, especially when I stand to preach. I've said many a times when I've spoken on Sunday morning and Sunday night at the end of the morning service, I'll say, come back tonight for the next message. It's part of it will be the first time I hear it as well. So you just never know sometimes what's going to come out but God's not surprised we may trip over our words we may think where did that come from but God knows it it's no surprise to him so it stands to reason if he knows what we're going to say he in his omniscience knows our thoughts as well uh, if we jump down to verses 23 and 24 of Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
See, again, if this were right, God would be omniscient, but he would just be observing us. But instead, he searches us. He searches me. He searches you. He judges me. He judges you. He knows me. He knows you. He's directly involved in our lives. And since that's the case, I want my prayer to echo what David said in Psalm 19. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, if God is going to know everything about me, I want everything about me to be pleasing to him. Why do I want there to be any unclean way about me if I know God's going to know that? So that needs to be our prayer is let it be acceptable in his sight. In verse 6, David says, you know, that this knowledge is far beyond what we as humans can understand. And, you know, there's difficult Bible passages. There's, there's wonders in nature around us. There's scientific mysteries, things that we are never going to know or understand, but God does. In fact, the first lie of Satan back in Genesis 3 was he told Eve that there was this God-like knowledge that God was keeping from, from her and from Adam. And that all they had to do was eat of the fruit and they would have knowledge and be like God himself. But it was a lie. This knowledge is not, it cannot be handled by the human mind. It's high. This, this omniscience is high and unattainable, and that's what makes God, God. If we were smarter than God, He would not be God. He would be lesser than we are. So if you think you've got Him, I've got Him on this move, I've, I've thought two moves ahead and I've got Him this time, no, you probably don't. Secondly, I want us to look at that God is omnipresent. First, he's omniscient. He knows us. In verses 7 through 12, he's omnipresent. He is with us. Beginning in verse 7, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. David cannot go anywhere that God could not find him. But also, there was not a place that not only could he not hide from God, but there was never a place that David could find himself that God would leave him alone, that he was not already there. Now in verse 8, if your translation is like mine, and if it says um, that if, you, if he goes down into hell, okay, a better translation of that is Sheol, the realm of the dead. This is not speaking of the same eternal hell that's the lake of fire that's meant for Satan and his angels and those who, are, uh, who die separate from God. This is just speaking of, of the realm of the dead, not the eternal, um, eternal hell that we read about in Revelation. Um, but it's an eternal, uh, that hell is an eternal separation of God. Now, it, we know that God can go into Sheol. We read that in the account of um, Lazarus and rich man, that parable. But the actual place of torment, it's not that God can't go there, 
But he doesn't go there because separation from God is part of eternal punishment. You know, sometimes we think the world is, is bad. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the restraint of the Holy Spirit is removed from this world? And, you know, Satan has to ask permission now. Just think about when he doesn't have to ask permission. Think back to Jonah. You know, after Jonah was swallowed by the great fish, he prayed to God, and God heard his prayer. He said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then at the end of his prayer he says, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So this sounds very similar to what David's writing. He's talking about being cast to Sheol or into the depths of the sea. And here in the depths of the sea, in the belly of the fish, Jonah, he even likened it to the very realm of the dead. But God was there. God heard his prayer from the belly of the fish, and he was delivered out of the sea. And we see here that David uses a lot of different contrasting statements when he describes these places that that he could not go to get out of God's sight. He says, heaven and Sheol, the wings of the morning, the depths of the sea, the darkness, the light, the day, the night. There's nowhere David could hide from God, but there was also nothing that could hide David from God. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what is called Global Positioning System. That's GPS for short. It, it's kind of almost eerie sometimes because somehow right now my phone is communicating with a satellite in space and pinpointing my exact location. Somebody somewhere knows right exactly where I am based on where my phone is. My watch has a feature that if I take a hard fall and I don't press something on it within a few moments, it will send a message to my emergency contacts with my location from the GPS so that someone can come to my aid if I'm in a situation that I'm knocked unconscious or, or whatever. You know, when, when my son gets old enough to drive and has his own cell phone, I know he's looking forward to that. You know what I'll be able to do? I'll be able to sit at home and see where you're at. I'll be able to know if you're speeding. But also, thankfully, and heaven forbid, if you're ever in a wreck, I'll know that too. But you can't, you can't hide from me. <laughs> but see, GPS, it's, it's really a marvelous technology, but it can be turned off. Or if we say, leave our phone at home by accident, it's useless if we don't have it with us. But God's positioning system is always on. It's always active. He knows where we are because he's right there with us. It's not that he is trying to find us. You know, when he asked Adam in the garden, where are you? He already knew. He was giving Adam an opportunity to admit it. But because he's right there with us, he knows where we're at already. You know, whether that's on the top of the mountain celebrating a victory or in the deepest valley of sorrow, he's there. Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. You know, we sometimes forget God in the good times, and we shouldn't. But I thank God for his omnipresence in the bad times and all times, that he is right there with us. Thirdly, moving on into verses 13 through 16, God is omnipotent. 
He's all powerful and he created us with a purpose. Verses 13 through 16 say, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. You know, David not only marveled at God's knowledge, his presence, but he marveled at his power as well. God knew everything about David's entire life before David's life even began. Before he was knit together in his mother's womb. Now, make special note of this. He did not say, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully evolved from a single cell organism that grew limbs and climbed out of the primordial ooze. He said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, not evolved. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I believe it was Adrian Rogers that said, if you can get past verse Genesis 1-1, the rest of the Bible should be no problem. Yes. You see, there are no cosmic accidents. We're all here because we're purposefully created. And God has a purpose for each one of us. And not only that, since we're created in the image of God, we have intrinsic value. You know, sometimes we think because of things we say or do that we're maybe worthless, but God says we have value. I remember a few years, years ago, Dennis, I know you'll remember this. You asked Fisher if he remembered being born. And Fisher didn't miss a beat. He said, no, I had my eyes closed. <laughs> and that got me to thinking, you know, each one of us, we come into this world rebellious and sinful and our eyes are closed to the things of God. I challenge us tonight to not remain blind to what God would have us to do. Now I believe our ultimate purpose is to love God and love others. And in that loving others it's telling others about Jesus. But now as far as a more specific purpose for your life that's between you and God, whatever his will is for you. But whatever it is, we have a duty to intentionally fulfill that purpose. Fourthly and finally, in verses 17 and 18, we see that God has us in his thoughts. He says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Not only is God all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, but he thinks about us. We're on his mind. Now, I'm not going to be so shallow to say that God loves you so much that he has your picture on his refrigerator, but he does think about us. And... David's amazed by this, and, and you may wonder why. Well, you think about his failure with Bathsheba, plus who knows what other sins went along with that and everything else. God's thoughts towards him could have been anger, could have been disgust, could have been uh, disappointment. But God's thoughts, it says, were precious and numerous because God had great love for David. Now, ladies, I want to ask you a question. I don't know. Haley might want to exclude herself from this one. Have you ever received a gift or a bouquet of flowers just because? You know, maybe your husband or your boyfriend or that secret admirer just 
just had you on their mind and wanted to send you a token of their love. And if you remember how that felt, just knowing that someone was thinking about you, multiply that billions of times over knowing that someone truly cares about you. And still that's going to fall short of how much God loves you. And that he, he has us on our minds and we don't deserve it. Psalm 8 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man and woman that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? We, with all of our sin, all of our flaws, all of our rebellion against God, why would God even waste a moment thinking about us? You know, we talked about his all-powerful being. He could have just obliterated us the first time we messed up. But he didn't. Adrian Rogers also said, God loves you and me. God doesn't love us all. He loves each one by one. Now I got to thinking about that statement. It says he doesn't love us all, but he loves us each. And I got to thinking about, let's, you know, a, a new mother, let, let's say she had, oh, let's, let's think this, she had quintuplets. I was going to go to eight for the octo mom, but let's bring it back to, let's say she had five babies. Now those five may be laid out in the maternity ward in the window and everybody going by seeing all five of those babies, oh how cute they are, how precious they are. Just seeing them all together. But I guarantee that mother knows each one individually, knows each one's characteristics, each one's differences and loves each one the same but differently. That's God's love. He doesn't love us just as a big clump of people that he created, but he knows and loves each one individually. He's omniscient. He knows each and every person. He's omnipresent. He knows where every person is. And he's omnipotent. Created each person for a purpose. And it's all because of love. So tonight, I hope you've perhaps rediscovered some wonder towards God that maybe you've lost. And I knew when I set to write this message on the greatness of God, I knew it would be an impossible task and that I would fall way short. Because the best description of God is that he's indescribable. And there's no amount of sermons can be preached to convey that. But I wanna ask you, and this is to my Christian brothers and sisters, does your walk with God reflect his glory? You know, the greatest miracle he's ever performed is saving wretches like us. That he would even care to do that. So a joyful heart should be the result of that attitude when the Holy Spirit is residing within us. People should know it. People should see something different about us. And I'm afraid that there's been times when I've had a sour attitude that people around me maybe that aren't Christians that knew that I am thought, well, I don't know about the God he serves. I'm not sure about that. Something we have to be mindful about. But for those who may be hearing this message tonight, whether here in the worship center or by radio or internet, and you're not a Christian, I want you to know God sees you, he knows you, and he has a purpose for you. He knows everything you've done, everywhere you've been and your purpose but that purpose is currently not being 
fulfilled since you're out of his will. But you can be forgiven and be saved. When you confess your sin to God, you're not telling him anything he doesn't already know, but you are agreeing with him about what you have done because he already knows all of it. We're each one on God's mind. And it's just so great to think how much he loves us. So much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, to take on our sin. But I maintain tonight that you will never stop being loved. But if you aren't forgiven of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus, you will be eternally separated from the one who loves you. And there's no coming back from that. So I'll ask you, friends, if you don't know Jesus tonight, this altar will be open, and will this be the night that you come to him? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your word, and I pray, God, that we will never be complacent to your greatness. That, God, in all things you will be magnified and glorified. And that our lives will reflect what you've done in our lives. Father, we thank you that you know all. That you're here with us now. That you're always here with us. That you have a purpose for us. And that you never forget about us. And I pray that if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who is not a Christian, that tonight would be the night of salvation. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.